this is my rank that I had, uh, staff sergeant and tech sergeant to advance this. I was head of a, a chief of range section of four anti-aircraft. No, 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 that's our uh, regimental insignia. And uh, the Purple Heart, I've got two of those really. And uh, I, was in, I was in artillery, anti-aircraft. And uh, that's a Philippine uh, award. Uh, I got them all on the And the other one was uh, the whole regiment got Purple Heart just automatically. It's about eight, ten feet high. Those are the, the represents the death march at... Uh, and what's uh, the names of the, your buddy here? Um, this, um, this oh, Jack Bradley. Bradley. Okay, yeah. Jack Bradley, yeah. We were real close friends in high school. I used to pick him. This is the uh, Baton Park thing up there on uh, Lomas and... Uh, mm -hmm. Guys entered in this last time, and uh, they are Okay. All right, first thing, can you uh, say and spell your name for me? My name is William Overmeyer, and the Overmeyer is anglicized from German, O-V-E-R-M-I-E-R. -E -E okay, and what was your, uh, your rank title? I was a tech sergeant in uh, Battery B, 200th Coast Artillery, anti-aircraft. And you were uh, a POW? Yes, I was. I was a POW for three and a half years. What was that like? Well, it was uh, uh, an unpleasant experience. Very informative, but not recommended by any means. <laughs> um, where where were you? Uh, I was on the in the Philippines and. Uh, uh, I did not make the death march. I got over to Cregador from uh, Bataan on the day Bataan surrendered. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw the white flag. A month later, we saw the white flag go up on Corregidor, and it was all over for them. So they moved us to uh, what we call Cabana Tawan Camp 3 in the northern part of Luzon, roughly 60 miles north of uh, uh, Manila, and I was there for about three, four months till about uh, September. Put me on a ship. Well, before that, the Japs came by and and sent a questionnaire around and said, "What did you do in civilian life?" Well, I'd been a student, not a very good one, but uh, I didn't think they'd be impressed with that. So I said, "Carpenter." My dad was a carpenter who built one of the first FHAs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I hammered nails and poured concrete. So I put carpenter. And would you believe that that moniker followed me all the way to Japan, Yokohama, Japan, to Mitsubishi Shipyard, and I was there for the duration of the war, up to the last three months of the war. So they were working you? Absolutely. That's the only reason they took us. We worked nine days and got the tenth day off. And uh, that tenth day was spent trying to get the fleas or the lice out of your shirts and pants and doing some reading if you could manage to scrounge up a book, which was difficult to do, or, or even uh, play cards. We managed to play uh, bridge. That's a, a, that's a very, very uh, important pastime in the, in the Orient, at least before the war. They had, they had championships going on all the time. My buddy and I played uh, against a team from, uh, uh, there were Portuguese subjects, British subjects from British banks in Hong Kong. Hong Kong had capitulated and uh, we had 17 nationalities in our camp.
But these two uh, Portuguese subjects, they, they didn't play by the, by the rules. <laughs> they had their own system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got up to 100,000 points behind. <laughs> but it was fun anyway. You played many hands then, I guess. Yes, we did. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned uh, the fleas, and uh, what, what were the conditions like? Were they, were they, were they pretty bad? Dirty? Yes, they were. We were, as I said, we were at Yokohama. It's pretty cold in the wintertime. It's about the same latitude as Albuquerque. And uh, we had a mountain to look at over there called Fujiyama, 60 miles away from our camp. We, we saw it every day out at the shipyard. Beautiful. But uh, we had a little wood stove but never anything to burn in it. It was, it was bad, bad all summer and winter. The main problem was the diet. We had a diet, so-called rice diet, but they used uh, uh, many substitutes, barley and a, a grain they called Korea, and uh, soybeans. Now really, the soybeans is the only thing to save us, the only protein we were getting. And, uh, well, as, with, as I said, we work nine days out of ten. We get that tenth day off, and everybody in the camp, we had 300 in our camp, and uh, our units, uh, I was in, uh, called B, we were about 26 men in the B unit, and the B unit would take their turns over time, and being first or second or third, and we took a, a bath and a in a great big wooden tub. It had uh, hot water heat in it, and it would tick and make a noise all the time. But if you were the last group and you had to take a bath in that water, it was nothing but soup. <laughs> Pretty dirty. Yeah, chunks floating around. But we look forward to it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, uh, uh, we had 30 minutes walk to uh, get to work, 30 minutes back, and uh, in order to uh, improve my card playing, well, I started memorizing uh, Culbertson's R Rules of Order. Uh, it's a, a book on, uh, at that time, it was the only thing for uh, bridge. Mm -hmm. And I, I memorized that for 30 minutes both ways, and. I got per, pretty proficient, but uh, you can't compete <laughs> the eclectic system, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you got rules. But I worked as a, sh as a shipyard, and when I got to the uh, Yokohama shipyard, they put me to work as a carpenter, believe it or not. Six or 7,000 miles away is when they took that notation, and it followed me all the way to Japan, and... Uh, 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 the Japanese word for sh uh, ship uh, is a ship fitter, is a carpenter, is toritsuke. And uh, that's what I did. I, I was one-on-one -on -one with my honcho all day long, and uh, sometimes we'd end up at the bottom of a ship with a piece of chalk. We'd talk about the war. He was always saying that the Japs are going to win, and we'd draw pictures, and we didn't know where in the heck uh, armed forces were, and, but uh, we had faith in our own outfit. We started seeing those uh, fighter planes coming over and taking on those zeros, and you can guess who won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're one-on-one you're, you're, you're one -on -one with your honcho. What's, uh, who's that? What's his role? Who's, who's well, the honcho, is, and that's another word for boss. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, he was a ship fitter also. Now he was a sub, sub honcho, and he would uh, direct me and what what to do during the day. He's a POW? No, no, he was Japanese, okay. and uh, he was directly under uh, uh, Yamashita, uh, Shimayama, the main honcho, and Shimayama is the one that stabbed me in the back with a cold chisel because. <laughs> I was always arguing with him about being able to do something a little better, 
And if I do it, just take it and turn it around, look at it from the other side. The Japanese don't work that way. They, they do it one way or they die in the effort. And that's, that's all she wrote. Anyway, this chap got, got mad at me and I said, uh, no, I didn't say anything disrespectful. I was just arguing. And finally, he got mad at me and came at me with a cold chisel. Well, I, he got a, broke the skin, that's all. It didn't really hurt me. I was holding his hands. And <laughs> that didn't help either. So finally, I said, uh-oh, Overmeyer, you've, you've, re, you've stretched the limit because I've seen guys die for much less than that. So I just put my hands down to the sides. And there was a professional fighter, boxer, over at the next way, and he was watching the whole thing. He come running over, and he was a hero. He slugged me right in the jaw. And I dropped to the deck. And that saved face, and I survived. I lived through it. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what happens. Uh, I guess uh, the reason that we're doing this story, there's um, the Japanese just apologized for treatment of, of POWs. Um, did you did you hear that? Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, I was a member of the American Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor, and they finally decided to call it quits because too many people were dying. And uh, the last meeting was at uh, San Antonio, and we had probably two or three hundred people in the restaurant there in the hotel. And we'd been trying to get somebody to do this for many, many years, and the Japs just wouldn't do it. And uh, finally, one of the State Department men came and was our guest at the front head table, and he got up. He didn't make a big show. He didn't bow or anything, you know, disrespectfully. And that's not a disrespectful thing, but uh, he did apologize, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, that closed the deal. Uh, I didn't expect him to grovel. <laughs> not that he would have anyway. Later, he came down the aisle, and I shook hands with him. I met him personally and congratulated him on, on the, uh, his efforts. And how did, um, how did you feel about that? How did I feel about it? I think it was an honorable thing to do. It's, uh, uh, it's a figurative speech thing type. Uh, it, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's not that we're going to get any funds out of it or anything like that because uh, MacArthur took care of that when the Japanese surrendered. He made it so that uh, uh, there would be no reparations made against Japan. Now, the British, I understand, they, they did get uh, compensation from the Japanese government or from uh, Mitsubishi or Mitsui or whatever company they worked for because they were really getting free labor during the war. But uh, we finally had to give up on it and say, it's over with and it is over. So, so him apologizing sort of put the, put the whole thing behind you? Or what would you say the result of that is? Well, I, uh, uh, I pretty well uh, accepted the uh, handwriting on the wall for years ahead of time. This dates back, way back to probably uh, in the 50s, uh, the years that the year several years after the Japan surrendered, which they, they surrendered in 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was, it was, there were numerous law efforts to collect uh, compensation from them over the years. California did a lot, but it always died in the Senate and the House because the State Department had deemed that uh, MacArthur had set the principle set the uh, principle already and uh, forget it. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no chance of financial compensation? But, uh, I might say that uh, 
I was at Yokohama. They had a, we had a, a, a deep slit trench right outside our door and uh, big enough to uh, 300 men to get in it and be protected from bombers. One night we had uh, 400 and some 25 B-29 bombers, now those are much bigger than the B-17s, came over and they came off of Fujiyama. This was after dark and with single file, Fujiyama got over our camp, turned a left turn and went right over Tokyo and dropped napalm, uh, fortified gasoline and drop HE on that and burned the majority of Tokyo flat. It was nothing but uh, wood and paper anyway. And the Americans knew that many of their uh, war efforts were done in, in homes like uh, possibly the United States did. I don't know. Did, took their work home. But uh, they firebombed that, that that town and it was just flat as a table when they finished. We saw the combined effort of their anti-aircraft, which was very ineffective, and two zeros they'd take on each plane that came over. And the, uh, uh, the zeros did the job. One zero would knock off the tail gunner, and the other zero would just sit back in the back and just pump lead into the, into the uh, tanks and they'd catch on fire. We saw, I did, I saw at least seven B-29s uh, go out over the ocean and, and die. And I think the, uh, the crews probably never survived. And it was probably at least 10 men in each crew. Yes. A lot of, lot of fireworks. Mm. After the, that uh, firebombing, uh, they took our camp, moved us out. We went north to a town called Sendai. It's about 100 miles north of Tokyo, and it was a coal mine camp. Before the war, it was a uh, too dangerous and not uh, the Japs had closed it and weren't using it. But when they got some free labor, well, they put it back into use. So there were uh, there were. Australians, there were Canadians, and all of our prison camp personnel were there going down deep into that mine. It was so hot and so deep that all you worked in was a, a G-string and, and those tennis shoes. Well, I discovered that they had what they called a Yama party. Yama means mountain. And uh, a Yama party, all it does is, is uh, take a pick and shovel and get all the vegetation off the side of the mountain, get the rocks and take them off and make the ground ready for gardens. One day, uh, a job guard came up and he, he said, Bakadan, Bakadan Taksan. And we said, yeah, yeah. Well, Bakadan is bomb and Taksan is big, big bomb. We said, yeah, probably a blockbuster or something like that. We didn't know what it was. We never found out till a few weeks later, September 15th, we got on that same train, went back to the same train station that we'd walked past for three years and uh, met the, uh, a, a brigadier general and uh, some Red Cross nurses. Oh, the, they look good, I'll tell you. <laughs> the general turned out to be the president of New Mexico State University, believe it or not. Uh, I can't think of his name, but uh, anyway, they informed us about the atomic bomb. That's when the first time we heard about it. But uh, it did the job. Uh, so what was, um, what was it like coming home? Well, it's, uh, they uh, put us on a ship, one of those Liberty ships. We went right back, we thought we were going home. 
and we hoped to fly home. Because a lot of the guys did get to fly home. I never even got on a plane all the time I was over there. Anyway, they, uh, they took us back to Manila. And we were on the beach there at Manila. And I needed shoes very bad. And uh, they issued me some GI shoes, combat boots. Well, they had uh, mold in them. And I got the worst case athlete's foot I've ever had. And uh, I spent another month there, sitting there on the beach, soaking my feet in potassium permanganate twice a day and cursing uh, my fate for not being able to fly home. But eventually, I was healed. I got on another Liberty ship, went back to uh, uh, San Francisco, but boy, did we eat good on that ship, I'll tell you. And that was the main thing on that, on that whole trip, how well we ate. They were trying to fatten us up, you know. And we, we were all underweight and everything. And uh, I got to the hospital there in San Francisco, and they said, well, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. Go home. <laughs> I got a check for $6,000 back pay, mm -hmm. and everybody else in the outfit got their back pay. Mm -hmm. Some of those guys went to San Francisco town and spent that whole $6,000 in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I guess you can do it in San Francisco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that does it. I wish that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to add? Anything else about uh, your story? I'd like to say that that atomic bomb was not a violation of civil rights or somebody's thinking about, oh, you shouldn't have done that and killed all those people. If we'd have had to invade Japan, they had orders out. I would have never made it back because they were going to execute all the prisoners of war. No kidding, that was a definite, absolute order. And it did happen in one of the islands, in the Philippines. They killed 150 men with gasoline and then machine gunned them. But uh, it, was a, it was a godsend that the, those bombs dropped. And the, the Japanese were a cruel people. You cannot imagine their viewpoint on civil rights and somebody else's life and so on and so forth. They did not believe that you should uh, consider somebody else's life. You should do what you've been trained to do and execute that person if you've got the orders. And if you've got the order to attack the enemy, you attack the enemy and die in the effort. That was their philosophy. And militarily speaking, it was effective. Their bonsai charges, there was thousands and thousands of needless killings going on because they had orders to do it and they did it. Tried to. I'll stop my preaching. <laughs> it's not preaching. It's okay. Um, I wish that we could, you know, uh, put a air this, you know, the whole interview, but they're going to, I'll take this back to the station and they'll pick a, you know, one or two quick little things out of it and put that on. I might say one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, our association here in Albuquerque uh, has accomplished the first one in dedicating Baton Park to over 2,000 members that uh, most of them never came back. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, goal that we had was to see that uh, the Bataan fiasco gets in the history books, grade books, grade school books, high school books, college books, in the history books, if nothing less than a, if nothing more than a paragraph. Mm -hmm. But get it in the books so people know what happened. Mm -hmm. Mistakes were made unbelievably. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's accomplished now, right? Uh, the Bataan March is definitely I don't think it's in any of the textbooks. Really? I don't believe it is. Wow. I have never heard of it. Be, uh, I, I'd very much like to hear it if it has, yeah. but I don't believe it has. Mm. 
There's, uh, when you think about our economy and how things are controlled and done in Washington and the different unions and uh, the teachers and whoever's in charge, politicians, mm -hmm. it's, it's an almost impossible task. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we'd like to see it done. Mm -hmm. To remember. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome.